Hi, I'm Steve Van Meter. Welcome to your weekly macro roundup. We talk macro and try to make sense of markets that really don't make any sense. And in today's episode, we're going to look at some A-level, pro-level trolling of the bond market by the smart money. You're going to love this. I mean, it's just, this is just smart money trolling at a whole new level. And I, I, you guys, you can't wait to see it. We're going to talk about the thing I don't want to talk about. Many of you have asked and requested. So we're going to give you the truth on the Banking for All Act. I know, don't really want to talk about it, but we're going to. We're going to talk about this time being up for the stimulus bill to get passed is coming soon. The clock is ticking down to the final hours. Party's almost over there. We'll talk about that. Look at the economic data. Some of it's pretty good. Some of it, hmm, not so good. And of course, everybody's favorite on Friday. What's going on with the credit date in the H.8? I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. So let's just get the one thing I don't want to talk about out of the way, and that's the Banking for All Act. Now, why don't I want to talk about the Banking for All Act? Because I don't care about it. It's meaningless to me. And I'm going to prove to you how meaningless it is. In fact, when I see the Banking for All Act, which I've, I've read the critical paragraph, and obviously the thing is not that long because I know uh, some of you have seen it, but when I see the Banking for All Act, I think about a tabloid newspaper. And this is what I'm talking about. I'm like, hey, surgeons cut my head off and sewed it back on. That's uh, Dr. Purple. Or FBI captures Bat Child. Dick Cheney is a robot. Bigfoot kept lumberjack as love slave. Okay, that's what I think of when I hear the Banking for All Act. And you know what's funny about tabloid newspapers? Nobody had missed a reading them. Nobody, you see these times, nobody had missed a reading them. And you know where they sit? And we've all seen them. You stand in the grocery store aisle or line and there they are. And you look at them and you're like, man, who reads that stuff? And yet the, the reason they're sitting there is because people buy them like crazy. People love sensational news. But on this show, you know, we, like, we try to look at the economic data, look at the facts. They give you my view on them and you don't even have to believe me. You can have your own view. What's key is... I show you where you can get the data. I welcome the fact that you don't agree with me because I listen to both sides. Doesn't mean I agree with you either, but that's great. We can all get along and maybe someday we will agree. And some of you are shaking your heads. That's not going to happen. Fair enough. Let's talk about the Banking for All Act. And what is that? That is this bill right here. Now, how many of you know that this was in the CARES Act and it got removed and now it's a standalone bill? Of course, the news and sensationalists are out there saying, ah, oh, this is coming, it's going to get passed, and the Fed's going to print money and give it directly to you, and you're going to have a Fed coin, an account of the Fed, and yeah, whoop de doo Look, do you understand how things work in, the, in, in Congress? Do they don't work the way you think they do. There are lots of bills that go on the floor of the House and the Senate and go nowhere, nowhere. How does that work? Let's pretend Steve's a congressman. He's not, never will be, and you wouldn't want me to if you thought that was a good idea. And I've got some constituents, or we'll just say very rich donors, who really have an agenda they want to push. And I really want their money because I want to get reelected, and that's how the system works. And they really want something changed about the Federal Reserve. So I call some of my friends in Congress up and say, hey, I, I, need, I need some co-sponsors on a bill. And, and it turns out we have some mutual interest because they have some donors that are big supporters of this and they, they want to make them happy. So we draft up a bill. We call it the Banking for All Act. We put some names on it and we put it before the 116th Congress in the second session. We even give it a fancy t a name, S.3571. And we show our big donors, look, hey, we're trying to affect change and improve things for you because you are big donors and write me some more checks. And then guess what happened? Nothing. It just dies. Why? Because lots of bills go before Congress and they go nowhere. That's how the game works. Only real bills, real serious bills, get picked up by the speakers or whomever the, the, the political powers of both sides decide that this bill is worth bringing to a vote or to the floor. And even then, a lot of bills get completely rewritten before they actually become law. They got to go to the House, to the Senate, and sometimes they go back and forth, and they got to go to the president, sometimes they come back. And look, it doesn't mean anything. And here's why this law really doesn't mean anything. In fact, I bet by changing the title of today's show for something about the banking for all, it'll get a bazillion hits because people love the sensational stuff. 
But I don't need to read this to know that this law is probably never going to see the light of day because the macro world tells me, and I want to show you how from a macro perspective, you don't have to read and listen to all this stuff. You can take a, a better perspective. And it's called take three feet back. So whenever you're not sure, take a step back. Because if you've seen Fed Chair Powell talk about the banking for all act, nope, sure haven't. You say, well, I've heard some Fed speakers mention digital currency. Yeah, because the, the central banks around the world are working on a digital uh, currency to go in between the central banks. Not, not for consumers. I mean, eventually it'll be there for consumers, but they're not there yet. They're working on that stuff. They're not talking about this. So first of all, the Fed isn't talking about it. That should be your first clue that this is not legit. Not going to happen. Second thing is, look at the bond market. What is the bond market telling you? If there was going to be all this new currency coming into the economy, why are interest rates not moving from relatively where they were back in March? Because the bond market is telling you this isn't true. You, are you as a business owner, for those of you who are business owners, have you gotten a word from your merchant processing system that you're going to have to start taking two currencies? Are you adjusting your signboards and your prices to show uh, dollars and Fed coin prices? Have you logged into your bank account and seen a new entry for FedCoin? Nope. You hear anything from the big banks, small banks, any bank about, hey, we're getting ready to handle the new FedCoin because the United States is going to a two-currency system. Nope. How about the auction data? You seen it? Treasury auctions, all of a sudden people disappearing because they're afraid that the Fed's going to start printing money and they can buy their own debt with it. Nope. Foreign central banks, still big buyers at the auction. You'd think they would be dumping their whole horde of treasury securities as fast as they can. How about primary dealer banks? Man, they're loading up on bonds. We got some A-list level trolling to talk about today from the commercial bank. Now, you think if they thought something was wrong, they would do, be buying bonds? No. Do you think as a world's reserve currency, if we were going to add another version to it, that people around the world would want to take dollars anymore? No, they wouldn't. And do you see them saying anything? Nope. So here's how you can never read the Banking for All Act and know it's probably never going to see the light of day because if you take a few steps back, look at the big picture, you'll see it's nothing. And on that note, I am feeling like some crown today. And that's right. Thank you very much. We are here and back. Let's get on to some uh, the economic data because, I, like I said, I can't wait to get to this pro-level trolling. Well, you know what? Let's talk about the stimulus, right? So what's going to happen on Tuesday? We're two weeks on Tuesday from the election. We've talked about before, it takes two weeks to ram a bill through the House, Senate, and the President, assuming everybody's on board and everybody, you know, the votes are counted and ahead of time and everybody knows, okay, you know, here comes, you know, the bill. Everybody, you know, vote, sign, do whatever you got to do, and it's done. We don't have that right now. And as of Monday, the clock pretty much expires because with the last two weeks left, there's your time limit. No one's going to do anything going into the election because they're going to be afraid of coming out on the wrong side. Now, what does that mean, being on the wrong side? Because you know people think that okay, November fourth, we're going to get we're going to Congress to get back to work. Nope. No, no chance. What you're realistically looking at, as I said, at the earliest a stimulus package at late February, when maybe we have a better clue of really how this is all going to pan out. And in between there, check this out. We've got, uh, I just found this out today, that uh, the residential evictions, there's a law that I guess is suspending those. Some of you may know more about this. Uh, that ends on December 31st. So no stimulus bill between uh, now and the election. Going to be bad news for the economy. And yet... You know, Marcus don't think to seem that's a problem. All right, so let's get on to the economic data and we'll move past this banking for all thing. And here we have going back to, I want to go back to Wednesday. There's Wednesday. Because in Wednesday, there's something, or no, was it Wednesday? I want to, um, Thursday, we're off, the oil data is just throwing me off because of the uh, holiday on Monday. So look at it, South Korea exports on Wednesday on a year-over-year -year basis. Exports were up 7.6, imports were up 1.6. I think we actually talked about this, and I can't, maybe we didn't, I don't remember. But what this means is the exports coming out of a big exporting nation are up. Now, that would tell you from a demand perspective, all right, wow, like maybe there is a recovery going on here. Let's keep looking through the data because you're going to see something from South Korea on Thursday that changes that view a little bit. Uh, let's look at, at uh, French CPI on a year-over-year -year basis went down from 0.2 to 0. That is disinflation. 
So let's go to uh, where's next up here. U.S. Export price index, year over year basis. So this is what when we're exporting goods and services, we went from minus 2.7 on a year over year to minus 1.8. Now that is an improvement, but we're still exporting deflation. How about import prices? Went from minus 1.4 to minus 1.1. We are still importing deflation. So those looking for inflation, you're not seeing it in the price index, and these are really, really key. How about unemployment claims? We still are, we're seeing un, initial jobless claims last week at 898,000, almost 900,000. But hey, con continuing claims are going down. They went from you know a little over 11 million to just over 10. So something good's happening, right? Well, that's all until you look at total unemployment claims when you take state and federal. And federal claim and total claims went down slightly to sitting at 25.25 million unemployed Americans. How do you get inflation? How do you get consumer demand, right? Because that's what I'm saying. All this demand for consumer products is going to lead to higher prices because there's a shortage. If you have less income, I want you to think of, if you have less income to spend. And yes, so some of your prices, say at the grocery store, we know are higher. So you got to dedicate more of your less income to sustainability stuff, so, so you know, food, sustenance, that leaves you with what on the other side? Less money for discretionary goods and services. That's deflationary. That's how you interpret this data. Let's keep going here. Find out some other interesting stuff. The New York Empire State Manufacturing Index still expanded in October, but at a slower rate. So we're seeing deceleration in the New York Empire area. How about Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index increase at a faster rate? So, so Philadelphia is still showing some expansion there. Let's move on to, I'm going to skip the oil data. There's still a lot of noise in that yet. How about South Korea now? Check this out. Remember, exports and imports were both up, but look at the export price index. Went from minus 6.7 to minus 6.2%. Meaning they're still exporting deflation. So there was a greater demand for lower price stuff. That's not inflationary. How about import prices? Went from minus 10 and a half to minus 11 and a half, meaning they're importing deflation. They just we can't get out of that trap. So it's very interesting to me. Now, somewhere in here is the producer price index data, and I may have missed it, but I wanted to point something out very interesting. Ah, here, producer prices. Okay, in the US, for September, inflationary improved. So this is prices coming out of U.S. factories went from minus 0.2% to plus 0.4. And you go, ah, okay, maybe there's something there. Okay, now let's go back to the consumer price index. And it was up 1.4%. So prices for the consumer, or no, month over month was 0.2. That's what I want to focus on, 0.2. Let me make sure I'm getting the right deal. Month over month, yeah, the year over year and the month over month were virtually the same. So month over month went from 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. So prices coming out of factories in September went up a bit. Now on the consumer end, in terms of pushing those higher prices to consumers, they went up at a slower rate. What you call that is a margin squeeze. So what that's telling you is factories are not being, are struggling to push higher prices through the system. Well, hey, we just figured out that consumers have less money to spend on discretionary goods and services. Starts to make a bit of sense now. Let's go on into the Friday data. Zoom down here. And what do we see? Italian consumer price index minus 0 0.5 to minus 0.6% deflation. How about Eurozone consumer price index minus 0 0.3 to minus 0 0.3 still deflation. How about the U.S.? Now we get some good data here. Retail sales year over year basis went from 277 to 5.36. And look at this. You can see, wow, retail sales are way up here. I even pulled the advanced resale sales, excluding food and services. Wow, we're talking cycle peaks here. You want to know why Congress may not be hot to do something? They're looking at the data and they're seeing the economy recover. Now, when I look at retail sales, I also look at the cash freight index. Now, I don't know if it wasn't updated for today, but I saw on Twitter that this was up higher, which would make sense. Uh, so per, usually it's updated around the same time. So maybe due to the holiday week, we'll get it um, next week, not sure. But one thing that I look at for the health of the consumer, right? When, it, when people have excess money to spend, you know, what do they do? They go out to eat. I mean, it's like one of those top things people like to do when they have excess money, because as we all know, eating out, not cheap. So look at this, we're seeing, 
food and drinking place is still running at a negative 14 and a half percent year over year rate. So people are buying stuff. Maybe they're stocking up. That could be. Don't know. Uh, what else is in the news today on the economic data? Capacity utilization rate went from 72 to 71 and a half. You want to look for inflation? Not going to find it in the cap you. This is telling you factory utilization is unchanged effectively over the last few months. So if you want inflation, you need to see a factory capacity running up in the 80% level, not down here, not inflation at all. And then we have industrial production. It rolled over on a year-over-year -year basis, and I thought I ran the, nope, I didn't run the year-over-year -year numbers here, but you can see from this chart, but let's do the year-over-year -year on the cap U, and what you see is no recovery here either. So industrial production is telling us what the fact the, the cap you data is telling us no recovery or the recovery is over. It's rolling over. The stimulus is gone. Remember what, you know, when was this data series over? Let's, let's look, let's zoom in and we can see we went from April, May, June, July, August, it's like six months. Remember, isn't that what Dr. Lacey Hunt said as a recent report, the stimulus will last around six months. There it is. It's telling us things aren't working. So the economic data on one hand on the retail sales is good. Again, are people stocking up quite possibly because they're not going out to eat that much. All right, now let's take a look. Let's talk about some A-level trolling because, man, the H.8 has got some A-level trolling in it. Let me show you on the charts first before we do that what, what, we're, what we're talking about. So let's go to the bond prices, right? Down here, we'll look at TLT, largest traded treasury, long-term bond treasury ETF. And what happened? All people panicked. Steve's an idiot, ginormous idiot, biggest idiot we've ever seen in our life. Doesn't know anything about bond market. Look at this. It's going to break down. Uh, interest rates are going to infinity times infinity. And, you know, this is it. This is it. This is finally what we've been waiting for. And I said, no, the bank's controlling the market here. You watch. They're going to come in and buy. Okay, and so did they buy? Well, we saw last week they bought up here. Did they buy here? That's what we're going to look to find out. And the answer is not on that chart. Not there, not there. How about here? The answer is yes, securities and bank credit uh, went up $22 billion uh, with mortgage-backed securities up 17 and U.S. Treasuries up five. There is your trolling. You now have the highest highest level of securities of mortgage back and U.S. Treasury securities owned by banks in history as of the week ending October 7th, which if we go back to that chart, just so you can see, was exactly the week ending October 7th was here. So what did they do? They came in, they, they took advantage of all these people they knew wanted to sell, that believed in inflation, believed all this $5 trillion of stimulus and quantitative easing was going to cause inflation, and they trolled them. This is A-level trolling. You know, you can't see this in the technicals because the technicals tell you, right? And many of you said, oh, Steve, you got this wrong, man. Technicals are telling you bond prices are going down, down, down. I said, no, nah, man, there's some A-level trolling coming right here. This is it. This is the smart money in play. They manipulated, got people to sell. They came in here and bought. And now we're going to see it again. And here the people are like, oh, well, they got up here. This is it. It's rolling over. Look, banks now hold the largest position in treasury and agent securities they've had in history. You really think bond prices are going down? Uh, no. How about loans and leases at all uh, commercial banks down 33 billion? Why do you think they're buying bonds? Credit's contracting, as I told you. Commercial industrial loans down 14 billion. Residential real estate, which all that really matters to a lot of things, down 5 billion. Commercial real estate, shocking to me, up a billion. How about the consumer? They're down 3 billion with credit cards down. Three billion. So there's your answer right there is, why are banks doing it? They know the economy's in trouble. They know it. Let's go on to back to the PowerPoints now. Take a look at the money supply. Growth rate is up 23.75%. Looks like it's topping out. The system of the rate of change has fallen just under 12. Three month rate of change is you know, just a little bit over one and a half percent. These are still pretty big numbers. What's going on in the M2? Underneath the covers, we see savings deposits are rising. So people are putting more money into savings. Demand deposits are falling. So as people are paying their bills, demand deposits are down and institutional money funds, money is flowing back into the market. So again, people are moving out of money markets and into equities, buying those dips, cramming in because they're going, they're afraid of missing out 
on the generational opportunity of buying stocks at the peak of the market. I wish them all the luck in the world. How about real estate loan growth? So why are we skipping the monetary base and the money multiplier? Because monetary base now updates monthly, no need to go over that. How about real estate loan growth down to 2.99 from a year ago? This is weak. You know, this is where we were, you know, back in 2019. This is super low growth. Not what you want to see at record low interest rates. Six month rate of change is at zero. Three month rate of change is slightly negative. This is not what you want to see. You know, again, we come back to the fact is you cannot see. I mean, you know, people, people find a bazillion reasons why I'm going to be wrong. And, they're, and, if, and, if you, and if all of them pointed and said they, I was wrong and they're not, but a lot of them say I'm right. Most of them say I'm right. This, this is the arbiter of truth right here. You cannot have higher interest rates when lending is contracting. I mean, think about it. If you're a business of, in lending money, you are a bank. And the amount of loans you have is going down, right, on the books because people are paying them down, making their payments. How can you charge new customers higher rates when that's telling you people don't want to or cannot borrow at these current rates? That is how you get lower interest rates. That's why banks are buying. They're, look, they get it. You want to be a side of smart money? Do what the banks are doing. They know exactly what's going on. How about commercial industrial loan growth? The, the year over year rate's still high at 15.3, but it's slowly falling. The six month rate of change, minus 6%. I mean, that's, that's, that's low. I mean, this thing is telling you the year over year rate's going ahead negative pretty quick. The three month rate of change is at five and a half percent, minus five and a half percent. Both are falling. All of them are falling. How about total loans and leases? Now let's bring the two together. Let's bring all this data together. Growth rate is down to 5.39%. On a year-over-year -year basis, that's fine. But look at the six-month rate of change. It's negative. Now, where would you get a negative six-month rate of change? Oh, in a recession? Where would you get a negative three-month rate of change at minus 1.62 in a recession? This isn't over, folks. Credit is still contracting. Until there's loan growth, interest rates only can go down. All attempts to make them go higher will be rejected. Because how about, you know, credit card growth rate? Are consumers outspending? Well, we're seeing them obviously in the retail sales number, but they're not charging it. They're paying with cash, down 9.62% from a year ago. Consumers are saying, look, we're not feeling confident about the economy at all. And so as we look at this from the big picture, right, we see this awesome trolling in the bond market right here in this long consolidation pattern that everyone said, this is the end, bonds are going to zero, bonds are there, no, this is it here, didn't get it the first time, ha ha, third time's a charm, and the banks are saying, no, we got this, we've got this, and we're going to show you that banks don't lose money because that's why they are the banks, that's why they're in their position there, they are the smart money, they're holding the other end of the trade, and so we saw some selling going into yesterday, and what happened, it hit this upper end of, res of that sell zone in resistance, it's very clear where it did that. And then, of course, what does that mean? There's still sellers here. So what do the banks need to do next? Well, they need to get prices to move up. This is going to be a hot zone where the sellers are going to put their last stand at. Once we get back up to here, all bets are off. Bond prices through the moon. Interest rates go down. We've already got uh, financial conditions being super t uh, uh, Lending conditions being tight. Interest rates are tight. Liking this video is cool. Subscribing to this channel is awesome because we give you the truth, not some sensational news about Dick Cheney being a robot. <laughs> Anyways, I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for joining me today. We'll be back on Monday, as always, to look at the how hedge funds are positioned, and we'll talk more about um, perhaps why you know, these short positions end up turning into big opportunities when people are squeezed out. I've been meaning to do that. We'll try to get to that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a fan. Thanks for commenting. I'll see you there this weekend. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. Serial is not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by our security and financial is or participating in particular training strategies. We will prepare by Steam Van Meter own personal capacity. Pins expressed the video that I do not reflect the view of Alice Financial Advisory Inc. or Steam Van Meter Financial.